I'd like to go just briefly into some numbers here, because numbers are the basis of all language, really, and all names. Um, the importance of numbers is following. Measurements will give us the numbers if we know the unit. If you measure something but you don't know what unit was built by the builders, then you don't get the number out of it. But if you know the unit they used, then you get the numbers. Okay, So that's why it's very important to know if these people were using royal Egyptian cubits and how long it was, or if they were using feet or inches or meters or whatever, because you get the numbers from that, and the numbers will explain things. Some numbers have special meaning. Numbers are not only quantities, but also qualities. Our world sees numbers just as quantities, and the bigger the number is, the better it is. Google means uh, the number 10 to the power of 100. It's the sort of biggest company on earth. It's the biggest, you know, so the bigger numbers you get, the better things are. Whereas in the ancient way of thinking, the most beautiful number was one because it represents unity. And God was represented as the number one. And the idea was to, how can you come back to this unity? How can you get into contact with this unity? Whereas our world seems to be going at top speed in the other direction, <laughs> towards the biggest numbers and the highest buildings and all that stuff. Anyway, these different qualities, I'll just go into this in a second for some of these numbers. This will be a very long subject on its own. Uh, but understanding numbers helps understanding monuments. So with all that, let's first of all look at the, the notion of trinity. So there's a, a current idea in Christianity, very strong idea of unity and trinity. You've got this image here. God is a kind of uh, representation of the unity of three different forces, which can be called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are different forces, three different forces. Uh, and God kind of appears in the middle of them, if they're united in some way. Uh, that is actually written in Matthew chapter 18. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So this idea that unity will appear if three forces are brought together. This idea exists as well in Celtic, or Celtic, sorry, uh, tradition. You have what's called the Triskel here, the triple spiral, uh, which quite clearly shows the same, quite clearly shows the same idea. Here it is engraved on a stone in front of the entrance to Newgrange in Ireland. You have here the triple spiral, where the three spirals are linked together. See, this spiral then goes round here and then links to this one and then they link together. The Trinity exists in Egypt. Uh, these three gods make one, Isis on the right, Osiris in the middle, and Horus on the left. Uh, the idea of Trinity is very strong as well in ancient creation myths in Egypt, but also in India. I mean, we could do a whole, you know, whole talk on this particular subject but I just wanted to embrace the subject for what we're going to see next. Now, there's also a big relationship between three and seven. The number seven is a very, very important number uh, in ancient uh, thinking. But a very interesting way to see the relationship between three and seven is the physical mixing, mixing of colors. Uh, we have the three primary colors here yellow, red, and blue. These are pigment colors, not light. Yellow, red, and blue. The joint between yellow and blue gives green. The joint between red and yellow gives orange. And between red and blue gives violet. Those are the three secondary colors. And when all the colors are mingled together, you get black. So basically, this figure shows the relationship, the physical relationship we can find in colors,
between three and seven, all right? So that's one relationship. Now, you can see it can be represented, the trinity we said earlier can be represented like this very similar shape to the one of the colors, right? Now, have you ever heard of happy numbers? Happy numbers, uh, 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 it's a mathematical term given to a certain series of numbers which correspond to a certain principle. The first four happy numbers are 1, 7, 10, and 13. Now, why are these numbers called happy numbers? It's linked to the sum of the squares. So if we take the number 7, if you do 7 squared, you get 49. If with 49 you then take those two digits and you do 4 squared plus 9 squared, that gives you 97. You then take 9 and 7, 9 squared plus 7 squared, 130. You then take 130, 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 0 squared equals 10. 1 squared plus 0 squared equals 1. A happy number is a number which when you square the digits of it, you end up with one. So that number comes down, boils down in some way, to the number one. And because it's linked to the unity, it's called a happy number. And all the other numbers are sad numbers. Yes, really, mathematically speaking, they're all sad numbers. And the, the first four happy numbers... <laughs> Uh, 1, 7, 10, and 13. Now, of course, 10 and 13, you can see they're happy numbers because if you work backwards along this, from 1, you come to 10, which is a happy number here. So 10 is, is well, it's a happy number because it's in this series. From 10, 130, or 13. So 7 is linked to 13, 10, and 1 in a series of squares like this. Okay, so those numbers are kind of linked together in a series called happy numbers. But they're also linked together by other things. For example, we have systems based on three, uh, three months in a season. Okay, uh, although we don't sort of realize it, our year is based into four periods of three months. Okay, so the three months in a season, now seven, of course, seven days in a week, and it's also octaves, the seven notes in the octave, and you could go on for ages about seven. The ancients had seven planets, seven metals, yeah. Ten, of course, ten is the ten fingers on your hand. It's the basis of the decimal system, but it's also the basis of what are called the decans, which... Uh, astrology today is divided into 12 zodiac signs, but in the past, each zodiac sign was divided into three. The Egyptians were very, very strong on that. They, each zodiac sign was divided into three periods of 10 days, which are called decans. And today, astrologers have virtually totally forgotten about the decans, and they were, in fact, the most important part of ancient astrology. The whole year was divided down into periods of 10 days, called decans. And if you take, for example, Aries as a star sign, each decan comes under the reign of a different planet. So according to when you're born in the sign of Aries, you're under exactly the same influence according to this 10-day system. So it's an interesting thing to know that the ancient calendar divided the year into 36 decans of 10 days. And 13, of course, is a number used in the calendar as well because we have three months in a season, but 13 weeks in a season. Four seasons, four times 13, 52 weeks, the 52 weeks of the year. So our calendar is actually based on these numbers, right? Although we don't actually sort of recognize that. <laughs> we don't realize we're living in that. And of course, you have 13 cards in a suit, you know, like clubs, diamonds, there are 13 cards. 
It's interesting to see that you have 10 numbered cards plus three uh, royal cards. So this ancient card, deck of cards, is quite clearly a representation of a system based on 13. Based on 13, okay? And it's interesting to know that the cards were brought into Europe by the gypsies, and gypsies were the servant, servants of Egypt. It's the same word, Egypt, gypsies. <laughs> you get the same origin, okay? So these sister, this number system can be traced back through the pack of cards to ancient Egypt. Now, these numbers, 3, 7, 10, 13, and number 1, right, uh, I've shown how they were uh, in Karnak. Uh, you had the triple square with the sevenfold square and how those two diagonals mixed together. So we had this geometrical relationship. This was the Lumenic alignments. The geometrical relationship between the triple square at the base here, this triple square here, one, two, three, and then along the diagonal of the triple square is placed the septuple square, and that diagonal gives us a double square. And that's, that's a relationship between three and seven, a geometrical relationship between three and seven, shown in Karnak. But you could also show the geometrical relationship between 3 and 7, like this. You could put a triple square, this time I've put it vertically, and you could place beside it a sevenfold square. Okay, so that would give you this system. And if you do that, if you want to pump numbers into this to get harmony of that, then if your triple square has a side length of 70, right, and your septuple square has a side length of 30, then 7 times 30 is 210, 3 times 70, 210, so that gives you a numerical harmony. And so the base of this shape, 30 plus 70, is 100. So we get this shape. So look at that carefully. Now, I'm going to use this as a base, and on that triple square, so here it's down the bottom here, so I have my sevenfold square and a threefold square here, and I'm going to add ten squares up here, right, which are 70 with a side of 70, okay? In other words, on top of these three squares, I'm going to add ten which will make a whole line of 13, okay? Now, if I have 10 squares, which have a side of 70, that whole thing is 700 units tall. Yes. And seeing as we have 100 units wide here, that means I can add a sevenfold square there with units of 100. Got me? Yes. So I have a kind of system here which includes 3, 7, again 7, 10, and 13. Right? Happy numbers. All happy numbers. So what I'm going to show you now is how this was used as the basis for implanting the pyramids in Egypt. This is brand new. First of all, before I do that, I'm going to show you an incredible link between the Heliopolis obelisk and the Giza pyramids. Now, I don't know if you've heard of the Heliopolis obelisk. A lot of people go to Egypt, don't go and see it. It's the oldest still standing obelisk in Egypt. Most of the obelisks in Egypt were stolen and put up in places like Rome and Paris and London and whatever, but there's still one standing in Cairo, in the northeast of Cairo, Cairo, um, at a place called Heliopolis, which was the initial sacred center of ancient Egypt. Uh, this uh, obelisk was re-erected after the first intermediate period. Uh, so it was re-erected, well, it was erected uh, around 2000 BC, 
Um, but it existed before that. The remains of a broken obelisk have been, were found, which dated from the ancient empire. So there was the ancient empire. Then there was a period of unrest and, and um, you know, everything got smashed up, basically. And then the pharaohs got back into power again. You had the middle empire started. And virtually the first thing they did was to re-erect a massive, a massive obelisk at Heliopolis. And the remains of the old obelisk have been found there. So it's it, the initial obelisk at this position dated from the ancient empire. Well, this is what we're going to see. It's northeast Cairo. Here's Le Caire, Cairo here. Here are the pyramids, Giza Plateau, and it's up here. Don't know, don't know. But what's interesting to point out is that the exact angle from the Heliopolisk obelisk to the pyramids is this. 225 degrees, in other words, 180 plus 45, it is perfectly orientated towards the southwest. 45 degrees this way or that way, right? It's exactly 45 degrees. Now, this is exact. There's the Heliopolis obelisk, and this line then goes down along the pyramid's diagonals. This is so incredible that I have to show you this on Google Earth. Okay, so here we are at the pyramids. Let's go up to the Heliopolis obelisk here. Let's go up here to the Heliopolis, Heliopolis obelisk. There it is. So it's, it's still there. You have the ancient temple here. You have the ancient temple of Heliopolis here. And here you have the obelisk, okay? So if I put a point here on the base of the obelisk, and I then go back to Cheops, and I come down to this corner here, that's 225 degrees, exactly. And it goes right down the diagonal. And you see that? It goes right down the diagonal. Now, the photo is a bit strange. If I zoom in, you can see I'm exactly in the corner here, right? But because the satellite photo is not taken from directly above, then that gives a kind of deformed image. But the angle is exact to one hundredth of a degree, and it's 23.74 kilometers distance, right? Okay, so that's something quite astounding, and obviously there was a relationship between the Heliopolis, Heliopolis obelisk and the, the two pyramids, because I can continue this line, okay, across these, right? It's not quite as exact. If I go to the end of the, the exact angle is the corner of Cheops, the exact corner of Cheops. See, 299, where is it? There you go, exactly in the corner, all right?